Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. My name is Samir Shah, and I'm a corporate M&A partner at Khaitan and Company. Welcome back to this, our third webinar in our M&A Academy program. Our first two webinars were tailored to remain true to their objective, which was to provide foundational legal knowledge to corporate executives, in-house legal teams, and other ecosystem participants around M&A transactional work. While unfortunately, most of our subjects are very dry in nature, our two partners, Ashutosh and Nidhi, did a splendid job simplifying complex issues and the audience questions made the sessions so very interactive. The response we have had to these first two sessions has confirmed to us that all our efforts in bringing these to you have been worth it. Therefore, we want to start by thanking you and we want to thank our clients, our well-wishers and our connections and audience alike for the overwhelming support and response to this, the m and Academy series. Our subject today is term sheets in m and transactions. While we started the Academy with webinars on share purchase agreements and asset purchase agreements, this begs the question whether these agreements truly are the beginning of a transaction or should we rather take a step back? And what we find is that while these agreements are indeed the end goal and objective of the transaction, the beginning is far humbler in origin, content, and manifestation, but no less important than the end objective itself. This is why we are focusing our attention today on term sheets and M&A transactions. And it is good for, it is important for a good M&A ecosystem participant to have a grasp on term sheets, how they are made, what they are meant to achieve. And this is of course our objective today. As always, in summary, we will have a formal presentation followed by a Q&A session with audience questions. We have already received several such questions as a part of our registration, but you will see on the webinar portal, there is a chat box which allows you to submit Q&A. Please do so, and we will continue to pick questions as we go. Like our first two webinars, if we again receive more questions than we can handle today, we will of course respond offline over email and connect with you. We will also send you the presentation, some summary notes, and a recording for your future reference. This recording will also be uploaded on YouTube and in the comment section, we will provide links to our past and our future webinars. So to introduce our speaker for today is my partner Ashray Rao, who is an m and partner based out of our Mumbai office, although he practices on projects nationally. He has more than a decade of m and experience, which includes training with a Magic Circle firm as well. We circulated his profile to all participants a few days back, but just to mention once again, he is an m and expert and carries tremendous recommendations and accolades in this area of work and has been consistently recognized by legal leading directories. His experience has been sector agnostic and structure agnostic, and in most instances, clients involve him from the very word go, including the most recent merger between Inox and PVR, which will lead to the creation of the largest motion picture exhibition company in the country. It is therefore difficult to think of a better partner to share his experience with you on this topic. So without further ado, I now invite Ashray to deliver his presentation. Over to you, Ashray. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Samir, for the kind words. Uh, hi, good afternoon, uh, good morning, and good evening to our participants. Uh, very, very excited to be part of the m &A Academy series uh, and take uh, this session today. Uh, when we're talking about term sheets, uh, you know, something which a lot of people would have heard about in the recent past, especially if considering the boom in the m and market, which has happened in the past uh, two years. It's been a record year for fundraise, buyouts and listing per se. And I don't think there's ever been a time in India when uh, things have been more exciting uh, in the m and space. Now, today the agenda would be to cover a couple of things. Uh, first, we would try and cover the basic questions on what is a term sheet and why are they used in MA transactions? And thereafter, we will try and touch upon a couple of variants. It can be a binding term sheet, a non binding term sheet, a short form or a long form. And more importantly, uh, we will cover some of the key terms which should be set out in each and every uh, term sheet to the extent uh, which is required or to the extent it definitely should be considered by the principles when you're executing a term sheet as such. And lastly, we'll sum it up with some of the key learnings and the takeaways from the session per se. Next slide. Before we start with the term sheet uh, 
I think it's interesting that uh, a couple of days back, uh, one of the clients uh, had called me to seek advice on a uh, MA transaction. The client had had some discussions uh, with a foreign counterparty to set up a joint venture in India in an emerging sector. They had exciting plans and had done a handshake on the key commercial terms which they wanted to undertake the transaction. And they had roughly a timeline of 30 to 45 days within which the legally uh, binding documents had to be executed. But the first question I asked him after hearing out the client was, uh, have you executed the term sheet? Now, why did I ask this question? We'll attempt to answer it in the next couple of slides. The first consideration uh, when we are looking at a term sheet is what is the starting point involved in our M&A transaction? M&A transaction usually emanates in a discussion over a room or I think in the recent circumstances post COVID maybe over a video call where the parties have a handshake on the general terms and are excited about undertaking the particular transaction. Post that the first step before we undertake the next steps as such would be to put a pen to paper and thereafter execute the term sheet which will be a short document which outlines the main terms of the transaction which has been agreed prior to moving on to the next step and the next steps post execution of a term sheet would be uh, undertaking a due diligence uh, confirming the assumptions were right thereafter negotiating and finalizing the definitive agreements for the transaction to be undertaken as such so the question is when we talk about term sheets term sheets is also uh, considered to be uh, i think also no, sorry the nomenclature for term sheets uh, is interchangeable with something called a memorandum of understanding there's something the heads of terms and also called letters of int uh, letters of intent between the parties and typically like mentioned it is executed at the starting of the transaction now a term sheet is a written confirmation of the main principal terms of a particular transaction which have been agreed in principle and the most important reason why it's executed is because it provides a framework for everybody else who's involved other than in the preliminary discussions as to the understanding and the principles which have been agreed and the manner in which the definitive documents can be executed going forward so more or less in simple words it's a base document which provides a guidance for what the parties want to achieve going forward and at times we have also seen that if it is a binding term sheet it also forms a base for discussions with various third parties such as lenders or regulators the important question is is it really relevant to have a term sheet so why do people always prefer to execute a term sheet when i think the biggest reason for why people execute term sheets is it bridges the gap if any with the verbal discussions and the handshake between the parties so today if the parties have executed that uh, for example we go into a pure fundraise transaction there's a new investor uh, he's excited about the company and he's intending to invest in the company now there can be handshake in the meeting but thereafter when we put down uh, the thoughts in a sheet of paper it identifies the expectations very clearly of the parties up front and if there are any key issues uh, it can surface at a preliminary stage before the parties can expend additional time resources or cost going forward nevertheless the intent of the term sheet is to form a moral commitment for both parties to observe this and also uh, a big advantage is especially when you're working on certain complex transactions uh, it highlights some of the issues which can prop up between the parties up front and thereafter give confidence to both the parties that largely the understanding is achieved and thereafter both of them can thereafter commit to spend more time and resources on the particular transaction as such. Nevertheless, it becomes very important uh, to understand what should be the focus when working on a term sheet. And the first one is from a advisor perspective, definitely, or even from a commercial principal perspective, it's important that the commercial alignment and the principles are set out on all the key issues between the parties. Now you can have various forms. It can be a short form, it can be a long form. Nevertheless, I think the intent is to focus on the key points and not spend time on detailing out the provisions which can reduce or increase the time involved in finalizing the term sheet as such, which comes to a first downside. 
of having a term sheet. The term sheet, while it's a very important document, should not lead to prolonged negotiations due to unnecessary detailing in the documentation. Now, it should not be the situation, and this is very important for everybody to consider, is that you end up negotiating the key terms between the parties twice over, one at the time of the term sheet, and second at the time of the definitive agreement also. Also, the second disadvantage of having a term sheet would be it may limit the flexibility of a party to negotiate further or change your position. Now, uh, you will appreciate that when we mentioned earlier where the it is one of the starting points of the m and deal, uh, the buyer, the acquirer or the investor in this situation would have a limited information compared to the seller or the target company in place. So the sellers are at a significant advantage over the buyer at this particular stage. So the buyer should be careful um, at this point. If agreeing on certain terms, it's always better to set out certain assumptions, but be aware that it may limit uh, or limit room for maneuvering at a later stage, notwithstanding the fact that it will continue to remain a moral obligation as such. And lastly, uh, it should not increase uh, the workload of the parties at the time of doing uh, the work term sheet itself, because like I mentioned, uh, if we are going down the route, the intent of a term sheet is to cut down the cost. If at all, there are key issues which are not solvable at this point in time, but making it unnecessarily long or leading to a prolonged negotiation will not seek the benefit of having the term sheet where the intent was always to bridge the gap and move on to the next things uh, in the transaction space as such. Next slide. So, the second question we have uh, would be, I think before we go into the different variants of the term sheet is, is there a standard form for a heads of terms or a term sheet? Uh, I, no, there is no standard form. Uh, it can vary from a simple one, two pager or a letter from the parties uh, and a signature by both of the parties to a very detailed document which is drafted by and negotiated between the councils and the principal. Also, the second part is, is there a strict convention on who prepares a term sheet first? Uh, there is no set convention. However, it is very common for a buyer or an acquirer to put together his offer on the table and initiate the drafting of this term sheet as such. On the different variants you may have seen in a term sheet, the common ones would be, uh, you would have heard about them, is a binding term sheet or a non-binding term sheet. Uh, let me start with the non-binding term sheet first. Uh, it's a bit of a misnomer to call it fully non-binding. The intent of the parties in a non-binding term sheet is to set out very clearly what are the key commercial principles that form the basis for negotiating the transaction documents going forward. And nevertheless, a limited set of provisions, which we'll also deal with as part of the key terms, would be binding. So a non-binding term sheet would constitute two parts. The Majority portion of the non-binding term sheet would be non-binding, while very specific provisions in the document would be binding. And a non-binding term sheet uh, is usually in a short form document uh, and will set out the principle underlying the issue. However, uh, there are exceptions to this, especially uh, when we're doing a complex transaction. Uh, I can think of an example where uh, we had uh, advised the CK Birla group uh, on their acquisition of uh, IT services entity called KPIT. Uh, in that situation, it was a fairly complex deal. It involved a merger or demerger, two open offers, and uh, a fair bit of structuring in uh, between the two parties. So in that situation, they did execute a detailed long form non-binding agreement with certain provisions being binding between the parties. But that is an exception and not the rule. Coming to binding term sheet, binding term sheets are usually executed uh, where the parties uh, have a certain intention to make it binding and it can uh, vary from, you know, one, it is used strategically to submit to regulators at a particular point in time or the parties have a time crunch and they will not be in a position to execute the entire documentation within a short time frame. So they execute a slightly long form binding agreement which would be uh, enforceable at a later point in time. Now, what when we are executing or working on a binding term sheet, we need to be aware of a couple of things. One, if you keep, make it vague, uh, 
it would not be uh, enforceable and also not advisable to uh, be entered into at that point in time. So it is better for a binding term sheet to be in a long form with more or less all the details well set out between the parties and very clearly uh, the intention of the parties to make it binding should be clearly set out. And lastly, the terms of uh, making it a valid contract should be followed. So when we uh, talk about making it a valid contract, it should be the offer, the acceptance, the consideration, the capacity, the certainty of the contract should be well set out and it should not appear that it is not a full contract by itself. So moving on, I think the key difference uh, between the two uh, would be as such, it's also in, depending on the intention of the parties, whether to make it binding or not binding, but nevertheless, if you're working on a non-binding term sheet or a binding term sheet, it should be fairly clearly and explicitly set out as to what is the intention of the party, whether the intent is for all clauses to be binding or the intent is for, except for some provisions of the agreement, all other provisions of the term sheet are not binding and will not obligate the party to contract and maybe consider using some terminologies like subject to contract or subject to approval. You can move to the next slide. It's interesting, uh, I think now let's focus on some of the key terms which we have seen in uh, different kind of term sheets. The first we will set upon a secondary and a primary transaction linked to a transfer of shares or an issuance of shares. Uh, and here, uh, let me just take two particular examples and help in uh, explaining the terms. Uh, the first one, uh, going back to my previous example on uh, uh, joint venture between the parties. Uh, so. Here it is important first to clarify in the term sheet what would be the structure with the parties are intending to do. First, do they intend to set up a new company in India for this purpose or utilize an existing company for doing the joint venture? And then what would be the contribution of each of the parties to the joint venture and how would that be structured? And like uh, my previous colleagues have mentioned, they are, can be an asset or a business transfer, uh, arrangement, it can be through a merger, it can be through a share purchase, it can be through a subscription. And in case uh, anything uh, out of the ordinary is set out, that should be something which is clearly set out in the JV structure. This, uh, with respect to the funding transactions, uh, I think it can be well set out as to who are the different parties involved, who would be the investors participating in this round, and how would they be doing the investment as such? Would it be a foreign investment or would it be through a domestic entity? And that clarity is important to be set out in the documentation. The second part of it would be on the investment terms as such. And when we talk about investment terms, agnostic of uh, how the transaction is proposed, uh, it should be very clearly set out what is the amount involved, uh, what would be the proposed investment size, the agreed valuation methodology and the valuation being offered by the investors at that point in time. And in case of a secondary transaction, uh, there can be certain other elements such as what is the price being offered subject to certain assumptions and if there are any variations to the purchase price. It can be an adjustment to the price uh, basis certain uh, valuation changes or some uh, situational changes which can happen. Uh, or if there are element of deferment involved in the consideration or is it a slightly complex deal like is there a swap or a non-cash element involved in the consideration or is there a holdback. So some of these are examples, they can be more complexity. Uh, the third one to be uh, set out very clearly is uh, the instrument involved. So going back to the first example of JV, are the parties intending to structure the investment by way of pure equity or do they intend to also fund a company by way of a debt instrument. Now these are different uh, elements involved in each of these uh, instruments and that subject to the commercial understanding is how do they intend to fund the company going forward uh, during their tenure as joint venture partners. Uh, with respect to a fundraise, uh, uh, it can be uh, through various instruments, different investors have different considerations. So depending on the series, depending on the investment round, you, are you uh, as your client investing by way of equity shares or the uh, investor considering uh, investment through convertibles, we should clarify very clearly as to what is the nature of the investment uh, or the instrument. 
um, and if especially if it's a convertible uh, i think it's important to set out uh, in some detailing as to what is the tenure what may be the conversion ratio especially if it's a complex situation we've seen people use uh, different formulas for determining the conversion ratio if something is out of the ordinary maybe consider including a schedule with a working example so that the parties are clear up front because these are some of the fundamentals on which the parties are doing the deal uh, i think the other two things which are important would be uh, with respect to the conditions involved in undertaking the deal uh, and one of them being uh, at this point in time more, more often than not the due diligence would not have been initiated so you would make a condition that uh, the offer etc is subject to a satisfactory diligence by the investors and in this era where uh, i think more and more emphasis is being provided on uh, esg policies as such it is very important to specify any out of the ordinary uh, situations like esg specific uh, diligence where environment diligence would be undertaken by some of the purchaser advisors or also uh considering now uh, with the russia ukraine war it may be a situation where uh, sanctions laws compliance becomes very important so a check and the diligence around that is also uh, important to be laid out uh, in the document and specifically uh, when other conditions would include uh, while you may have limited information at this point in time uh, specify that any third party approvals such as lenders or regulatory approvals uh, would be required for the parties to consummate the transaction and in uh, some situations we've also seen where the valuations have uh, are subject to certain numbers being provided by the target uh, at a particular point in time so we would set out an assumption and a condition that one the assumption that the information provided was true and correct and also specify a condition that these are subject to receipt and confirmation of the numbers provided for by the target entity as such uh, we can move to the next slide in addition to uh, the uh, investment terms uh, in a transaction it's also important to lay down uh, what are the different interse arrangements uh, uh, which would include obligations or rights of each of the parties involved and we can bucket them accordingly in a funding transaction it can be uh, founders in one bucket the investors in one bucket and in investors bucket you can have you know uh, various combinations of probably what round it is series a b c all of them bucketed accordingly and all of them will have be subject to different rights and obligations as such so the first important one would be uh, uh, governance structure I, each of these investors uh, uh, who would be looking at investment uh, and if they are investing over a particular threshold would like to have certain representation on the board of uh, the target company uh, so what would be the extent of the representation? How much would be the founders entitled to? How much would be the investors entitled to? Are two, three investors coming together to appoint a single uh, director? There are times when people don't want to take the risk of a director. So they would want to have certain observer right. So these are some of the provisions that you put out with respect to uh, the governance. Um, an additional point is because of the Companies Act requirements, um, you may be aware that in a public company, uh, pure convertible may not be entitled to vote except for certain situations. So you would have want to have uh, certain specific uh, rights which protect uh, the minority interest. Um, and this can also happen in the other situation because uh, under the Companies Act, strictly speaking, uh, there are uh, board rights, there are rights with the shareholders need to approve, but the threshold for shareholders to approve would be at 50% or 75% unless you've entrenched uh, for a higher threshold. So it is important at this point to have certain affirmative voting rights, uh, which each of these investors can approve and the list can be commercially agreed and set out so that parties up front are clear as that there are certain provisions which are specifically uh, put out in the agreement which require the consent of the investors before a decision can be made. The second would be in the say uh, shareholder rights. Uh, this can include uh, fr from anything like you know the investors who are participating in a particular round would like to also have uh, the rights to participate in a future fundraise called and this right would be uh, called something as a preemption uh, also uh, to protect your interest you would like to have certain basic information rights on a regular basis which the company will undertake to provide uh, from time to time and also uh, get some rights with respect to inspection uh, where uh, the investors uh, can inspect 
the audit or sorry inspect the premises and the company uh, through their councils uh, especially looking and reviewing the books and records of the company and these are all uh, methods where uh, the framework and the governance of the company will be uh, ensured to be strong uh, from my investor perspective uh, next we come to the obligations inter say uh, different shareholders um, again in the same fundraising example uh, how each uh, investor decide uh, or be subject to certain restrictions or and how would the promoters be or the founders in the a company be subject to certain restriction um, and some of the common ones we've seen uh, would be uh, you know having a right of first offer or a right of first refusal a tag along or a co-sale right restrictions on uh, transfer to competitors um, also have some bit of restrictions on you know selling uh, on a non-compete basis so some of these are obligations investors may not typically agree on transfer restrictions but you know when there are multiple investors involved how would the process work and also considering that the investors are backing the promoters and the founders would the founders be subject to certain additional restrictions over a period of time is a discussion point which should be clarified and set out uh, again to come back uh, to our earlier point there is no requirement to make it as robust as possible i think the intention is for the parties in the term sheet to lay down the principle and leave out the detailing to the uh, definitive documents because at this stage if you spend too much time on the procedures involved with respect to each of these rights you may be spending unnecessary time uh, and that may not be very productive for the parties uh, at this juncture at least um, going on uh, in exit rights are very very important uh, now these are important for a financial investor so coming back to the example where we spoke about the two situations one is a joint venture and other is a fundraising uh, situation exit rights would not be that relevant in a strategic investment because a joint venture is where two strategic parties are ideally coming together to work on a business for a period of time and a financial investment where the investors are backing the founders and the company for a certain period of time but for them to achieve an exit is uh, fundamental so you would have to specify what are the obligations of the company to provide the investor with an exit within a particular timeline um, and some of these things include a uh, initial public offer obligation or a qualified initial public offer obligation uh, followed by a third party sale uh, you can include uh, some obligation like a drag along right or have uh, put on a call option as a last resort but these are all negotiated but important at that point in time to specify clearly as to what is the obligation and how will the company help the investor achieve the uh, its purpose and objective of uh, achieving a clean exit after a period of time uh, lastly uh, the framework or the operational framework with respect to uh, the company becomes important and uh, like i mentioned earlier again elg is a, a very big theme in the market everybody is pushing for it and a lot of investors have a very high standard of governance to be followed so now because you see a, co a covenant from the company to comply with some of the obligations such as esg policies should be well maintained you can have certain a back policies to be maintained or also ensure that you comply with the taxation law you comply with applicable law as some of the brief covenants to be included also important would be to specify who will be the auditor of the company because you may have seen uh, india has had a share of uh, past issues where uh, the financials of the company were not uh, well maintained so a lot of investors do push for some standards in maintaining uh, the books of the company and that can happen by way of appointing uh, certain reputed auditors uh, you can also importantly uh, put out uh, what would be the plan with respect to uh, a business plan of the company uh, so because this is the fundamental with respect to either a strategic or a financial deal because the parties are investing basis the promises and the future uh, of how each other look at the company in the three to five year time frame and all of this is set out in detail in a business plan now not necessary at this point in time that the entire business plan is agreed but some of the key principles if there is something out of the ordinary is important to set out in a term sheet to discuss and finalize between the parties and the last one uh, which we've seen more often than not is also how you know funding uh, or a financial transaction uh, how are the management uh, of the company being incentivized uh, this can be by way of uh, any esops or any kind of uh, structured payments to be done so this is something which you can lay down in principle and uh, it's also important in uh, a lot of buyout transactions by private equity where the 
uh, private equity may own majority of the company, but their investment is uh, subject to backing the management to deliver good results and uh, ultimately outperform their competitors in the market. So a well-structured uh, management incentive is uh, very key. And this is also a good incentive for the company to engage uh, with different investors as to who is providing them better incentives as such. Can we go to the next slide? While these are called uh, miscellaneous, uh, I think the last uh, few terms which I would like to emphasize uh, or emphasize would be uh, on some of these which are set out below and something like a confidentiality, termination, right? and uh, exclusivity these are and non solicitation are also some of the terms uh, in a non binding term sheet which would still be binding on the parties now why the important confidentiality easy to say that uh, it is the most important provision because term sheet again uh, like you mentioned more or less may be binding but may not be binding but you would have had some discussions and as a starting point in the mna post the term sheet you will engage with the uh, buyer acquirer from a seller perspective uh, you are engaging with their advisors you are engaging with various third parties involved you will be sharing a fair bit of information and you wouldn't want uh, th if the deal doesn't happen you wouldn't want this information to be used by them uh, for any other purpose than for considering their investment in the company so a robust confidentiality for a period of time uh, should be uh, well set out and clarified in the document so that each party observe the conditions the second point with respect to non-solicitation is uh, once you have access uh, from a company perspective, you would have your key persons uh, engaged in this. You would be expending a fair bit of time and resources uh, in discussions, in, in uh, sharing information, uh, or you know, for any other purpose which the buyer may want to assess. So at that point in time, you would not want the new investor or the buyer or uh, third party to be uh, soliciting or poaching your employees or uh, it can also happen with respect to certain customers uh, so it's important to lay down the principles of a non-solicit uh, for the time period during which the term sheet is valid and for a time period post its expiry as such also so but nevertheless uh, i can give you one example where uh, two strategic uh, partners uh, or uh, companies in a sector were trying to merge with each other and this is a sector where there are three four major players uh, what did happen was uh, this became a very sticky point for both the parties and the problem which one of our clients faced at that point was as on the the competitors are not restricted from uh, getting into non-solicitation so while we may execute a term sheet we may start discussing with each other uh, the trust element was very low. So if you do end up on a non-solicit obligation, and especially for a period of time after term sheet, it would it may uh, you know substantially impact the way they're undertaking their current business. So this became a very sticky point, and ultimately uh, the term sheet didn't go through because of a non-solicit clause. But uh, like I mentioned, these are some of the points to be considered, discussed, and assessed at the time of the term sheet itself. Uh, going by the uh, term, termination clause, let me take it up with the exclusivity and again start with uh, example. Exclusivity, uh, as you may be aware, is very important uh, for especially uh, certain private equity investors or a strategic buyer have clear mandates that they would not expend any time resource on a particular transaction unless they are offered exclusivity by the seller or the company itself. Now, this is so because they would be very serious uh, they would be serious about working with the partner uh, or the counterparty at that point in time but if they are they are aware of a situation where there are competing bids etc they may not want to spend as much time so from their perspective uh, if we do work on uh, exclusivity uh, it's beneficial for the buyer, but from a seller or a company perspective, uh, the time you execute or undertake an exclusivity, you do tend to lose your leverage uh, because the buyer would know at that point in time uh, that you know you're only dealing with one person. So you have robust provisions to say that at this point in time, after the term sheet for a period, uh, the seller would not negotiate, share information with any third party. Uh, and will only focus on the discussions with the person to whom exclusivity has been granted. But linked to this is the termination clause. 
Now, exclusivity, uh, the buyer and the seller will have uh, prolonged uh, discussions on the time period involved for which the exclusivity will appear because from a buyer perspective, the longer it is, it is better. But from a seller perspective, uh, he would want to limit it and put some pressure on the buyer that, look, I'm offering you a time period within which I'll deal only with you. But if you're not able to achieve or the parties are not able to come to an understanding on the definitive agreements by this time period, the agreement will collapse and I can discuss with a third party as such. Now, give, let me give you an example. Uh, sometime, uh, one, uh, one particular instance where a global private equity was working uh, to do a transaction with a seller and a target company. Unfortunately, the timeline involved and what was offered by the seller was extremely low. Uh, while there was a lot of activity which happened in the two weeks and the parties were very, very close to signing it, uh, and the seller did not extend the exclusivity after the expiry happened and you wouldn't believe within four days of what the expiry of the termination or the expiry of the term sheet had happened the counterparty uh, executed a deal with a competing uh, private equity player now was confidentiality breach we're not aware of that but it's important at that point to very clearly set out from whose side, uh, whichever side you're working for, buyer or the seller, to clarify in detail what would be the termination date or, and this is usually referred to as a long stop or a drop dead date as such. Uh, the last two elements I want to cover in, uh, with respect to cost and expense. This is very important uh, when we are working on certain specific transactions, especially uh, where it's a complex in nature, maybe a merger or a demerger where there can be substantial costs involved. So it's a discussion point we should be uh, having at the start of the transaction as to who will be bearing the cost there or it will be split equally. Uh, and you'll have other costs involved with respect to uh, in a funding transaction, especially it's uh, fairly common where uh, the company uh, agrees to bear the due diligence cost, which will happen uh, post uh, the execution of the term sheet uh, to bear that cost, uh, which the investor is incurring. Um, so some of these points are good to have uh, and will be clear upfront if parties put the thought process in a piece of paper. The last one with respect to uh, representation, warranties and indemnities, uh, again, not going into the detailing of uh, what are the kind of warranties and what are the kind of indemnities which will be provided because uh, of course at this point the buyer has limited information, but at least the expectation of uh, what kind of deal are the parties expecting. We can we have seen instances where it can be an as a deal, uh, but more often than not, if there is a funding transaction, uh, the clarity on who will be providing the warranties and the reps because these are the fundamental risk allocation items uh, will be important. And also who will be providing the indemnity because ultimately you would want to have a person uh, with adequate financial wherewithal to provide uh, the indemnity uh, to the investor or the buyer coming in. So that clarity can be set out in principle as to who will be providing the reps and warranties. Is it the company or company along with the promoters in a funding transaction? And also who will be providing some of these indemnities? And if there is an indemnity by the company, would there be a gross up for the investors to recoup the losses involved because of the percentage he holds post the transaction as such? Move to the next slide. So I think uh, this is some of the discussions or you know some of the points I've highlighted. I think the key takeaways is I think the first important one would be with respect to I think it's very important uh, from uh, uh, I think advisor perspective or even from uh, um, a company engaging in M&A that you should seek uh, legal and tax advice prior to committing uh, a term sheet and this is especially because if the intent is to make it a binding document then we should ensure that there is enforcement and it's legally uh, do, uh, workable in a court if there is a dispute as such or even if it is um, a non-binding term sheet it should be clarified that there is no intention to create a legal relation inadvertently so that is important to ensure and also uh, it does important uh, to set out any specific uh, critical condition as such can be highlighted so we had a recent example where uh, one of the parties was uh, one of the clients as such was trying to uh, work out a deal with an uh, investor whose investment vehicle was from china now 
it was important because of the press note three restrictions for the parties to consider whether it's worth going down the route of getting the approval or should they explore an alternate structure which can work within the framework of the law as such. And lastly, I think tax plays a very, very important role uh, and the benefits can be either to the buyer and the seller. And we've also seen a lot of times where structures are implemented uh, with in a much more tax efficient way uh, compared to what the parties originally had in mind. So important for uh, attorney to consider uh, the proper adequate advice at this point. The second and the third conditions, as we mentioned, identify some of the key conditions, but confirm the offer and confirm the key assumptions which are made for the offer as such. Uh, and this becomes very critical, you know, what we mentioned earlier to, to summarize whether the financials and the data which was shared at the time of forming the term sheet is true and correct. Uh, also, you know, if there are a valuation provided for that this valuation assumes a certain number and it can be, you know, a profit, it can be linked to EBITDA, it can be linked to certain uh, uh, qualifications, uh, etc. But that intent of the parties to clearly set out the assumption should be there. And also, like you mentioned, uh, it should very clearly set out whether the intent of the parties have language in the document to doubly confirm the fact that is it the intent to bind or not bind the document. Now, uh, it can be a situation where uh, you know you may have uh, a doubt over it, but I think it's better to get advice, better to uh, clarify in specific language uh, to ensure that the intent is set out. Now, again, uh, the last point I would like to highlight is uh, again to reiterate. I think the intent of the term sheet should be beneficial to the cost involved and the time involved. I think we should be mindful that timing is always key uh, when working on a term sheet and it should not be the case again that we are negotiating the documents twice over one at the time of the term sheet and again repeating the entire procedure for a long period at the time of doing the definitive document so some key points you can consider would be uh, you know uh, i think some of the key things uh, we, i keep in mind at the time of doing the term sheet is state the principle and you can defer the detail you can state the exceptions and defer the rules uh, you can put in language to say customary xyz will be agreed between the parties in the definitive document and also maybe consider putting in some language to say uh, that the heads of terms of the term sheet are not exhaustive no and the parties will discuss further on some of the key terms but achieving the objective of signature may be important at that point than deliberating on uh, every single issue uh, so having said this uh, thank you very much for listening uh, hope you found uh, some of the sharing uh, the learnings uh, helpful and uh, over to Samir. Great, excellent. Thank you very much, Ashre. That was that was very, very informative. I like that state the principle, leave the detailing and state the rule, uh, state the exception and leave the rule. I think that's that's a very good way of putting it. So the chat box has been buzzing. That's what I've been doing with my camera off. And uh, there, there's a whole host of questions we need to take up. So let's dive straight in. Um, we'll give you a moment to catch your breath. <laughs> right. So we have uh, the first question. Are CCI approvals part of a term sheet? Would you make them a part of a term sheet or not? And maybe you can consider CCI and any other regulator that might be relevant. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think we should specify uh, what conditions are important. And you know, at this juncture, uh, the parties would have a good idea to understand the nature of consent required. and at that point in time, if CCI approval is relevant, uh, that's something uh, we should definitely consider. Like I mentioned earlier, along with that PN3 or some other conditions should definitely be put out in the document. Now you have somebody obviously has had the raw end of exclusivity. So this person is saying, but sometimes even though there is an exclusivity clause in the term sheet, even then the seller ends up selling to the competitor. How does law work here? Can we actually enforce an exclusivity condition and there are a couple of other similar questions there's a question on whether binding clauses are enforceable in indian courts so maybe you can bundle them together no absolutely uh, i think we mentioned earlier uh, in a non binding term sheet uh, again there are certain clauses which are intended to be binding and exclusivity is one of the more important ones while doing this i think the parties should be mindful one of course the legal language around how exclusivity is drafted uh, should be very clearly set out. But even at this point in time, exclusivity as such, if it is breached, 
you will have an enforcement right you can approach the court and uh, you know it depends on what uh, dispute resolution process you have agreed for in the term sheet so this should also be one of the binding terms uh, in a binding or a non binding term sheet very clearly uh, it would be great to have arbitration in the situation because uh, it provides you some of the advantages compared to the court but at this point uh, i think more than damages uh, which is definitely available uh, for any breach of contract in india we should have a right to seek and achieve an injunction so that if we are able to establish to the court that there was a breach of exclusivity the court will grant an interim injunction for the competing deal which has happened during the time when you were entitled to certain exclusivity obligations so the same there seems to be a similar sort of question that exclusivity doesn't necessarily involve that third party so again just on dispute resolution they they're trying to figure between courts and arbitration which one do you choose and why maybe you just want to dwell on that a little bit for it for the term sheet definitely uh, i think uh, uh, there are definitely advantages to uh, a court uh, or uh, arbitration depending on how you intend to choose uh, arbitration uh, is the preferred for most of the investors solely because it's of the confidentiality involved uh, you know both the parties would like the dispute to not come out in the public forum as such without uh, you know first having that arbitration being discussed between the parties as such uh, nevertheless but uh, uh, even in arbitration at times uh, they can be delays or involved uh, but the order as such is duly enforceable so i would definitely advise parties to go down the arbitration route uh, compared to court but if in a situation where you have uh, uh, international arbitration for so you know where the seat of arbitration is uh, set out in singapore uh, which is fairly common for a lot of foreign investors to execute uh, also please do have a carve out for uh, approaching the indian courts for interim relief uh, and that would be the first step which would be very helpful in uh, at least enforcing the immediately available remedies as such so this was on dispute resolution under the term sheet there's a question on dispute resolution under the main agreements and whether the term yep. sheet should specify the governing law and the dispute resolution for the main agreements what's what's our thought there i think it's good to have uh, because uh, a lot of alignment uh, can happen uh, upfront because uh, we've seen um, a lot of pushback especially if there is an indian party involved who's used to dealing with a lot of indian investors at that point in time and the first time they're dealing with a foreign investor they would prefer a neutral jurisdiction and they and you know it's more often than not uh, people would choose the singapore or a london with uh, institutional arbitration rules so from that perspective uh, it would be important to maybe set out the principle that the definitive agreements would be governed by way of uh, neutral jurisdiction the arbitration rules would be our the ciac or lcia and it will be in london or singapore because if there is a mismatch of this uh, the parties can discuss debate it and clear it uh, so we've seen this and it's a fairly uh, common uh, point to be uh, debated at the time of the term sheet too so it's always good to set out up front uh, what is the expectation of the parties for uh, dispute resolution in the uh, main legally binding document okay there is one question on in fact there are two three questions on stamp duty so does a term sheet require stamp duty people seem to have different practices it seems uh, no i think uh, as a lawyer i would always advise uh, any document which you intend to enforce should be uh, duly stamped like uh, any agreement right now um okay you mentioned something about using a term sheet to obtain a government approval and there's there's a follow up question around can a term sheet actually be used to obtain a government approval will the regulators in will will they entertain that a very interesting question actually for me like uh, i think it i don't think there is a rule around it uh, but in our experience we've seen uh, a binding term sheet uh, been well i would say accepted by some of the regulators uh, we've had instances where the competition commission of india has considered an approval basis of binding term sheet uh, we've had the reserve bank of india uh, look at a binding term sheet in more serious terms of course 
not giving its approval basis of ending term sheet they looked at it they gave their preliminary comments on what is okay with them and what is not okay with them and thereafter you know request the parties to make the basic changes and thereafter come to them with a signed definitive document but yeah uh, def one of the reasons why people do binding uh, term sheets is also that they can present it to a regulator as such and but again it's not the rule it's a more of an exception it can be situations where regulators can accept it um, and provide their approval uh, based on the term sheet. Great. Um, there's one very interesting question on confidentiality and it really takes a deeper view of confidentiality. Perhaps it's a little basic, but important to cover it. Is it possible to disclose the conditions of the term sheet to the court in order to seek an injunction even though the contents of the term sheet are considered as confidential information under the relevant confidentiality obligations somebody's really taken a deep dive into confidentiality and very very important uh, i think uh, these are uh, when we are drafting a confidentiality clause uh, even if it's a short form uh, we do include exceptions to it and one of the exceptions uh, we can clarify is to present it to a regulator or to enforce this document as such there will be an exception to the rule uh, and you can see, uh, for example, like uh, when two listed companies are doing term sheets, uh, most of those are confidential in nature. But, you know, uh, by the time you are executing a document, uh, especially if it's a binding term sheet, uh, it would constitute a Reg 30 disclosure, uh, which you are required to uh, inform the exchanges. So a confidentiality obligation would be in a direct breach of that. So you would have to think about some of these situations and provide for exceptions and uh, providing to a regulator or uh, Enforcing the right to the agreement is a, a standard kind of exception to the confidentiality rule. Of course, uh, what you can build around with uh, the bells and whistles around it, whether you know you need a prior intimation, prior confirm uh, confirmation, etc. But these are some of the exceptions which are provided for. So just on the listed term sheet itself. So let's say there's a publicly listed target. Any specific points to be borne in mind uh, around that target for a term sheet? Absolutely. Uh, I think it's very, very important. Uh, there are two, uh, three things to consider. Uh, the preliminary one is what I just mentioned about uh, Regulation 30. Uh, there are disclosure of certain material events. Now, it's a call to be taken at that point in time, uh, whether one it uh, falls within the automatic requirement because any agreement not in ordinary course would be a mandatory disclosure item or if you think this is something which does not fall within that uh, basis the amount involved you need to consider whether the materiality policy of the listed company has been breached uh, that's the first point the second or more important point would be uh, especially in a listed company uh, the takeover code uh, provisions had to be uh, examined uh, not just an agreement but an agreement to agree also would trigger the code there are uh, judgments around it uh, which party need to be mindful of uh, including baron energy so even a signed document uh, which would be uh, required to acquire shares etc may trigger the code so the parties have to be extremely mindful of the wordings and the strategy uh, at that point in time as to how they intend to do a deal when involving a listed company, then please, please involve uh, and take legal advice with respect to uh, listed companies because the implications are multifold. Uh, what can happen is um, while the other parties may execute a non-binding, thereafter go into triggering the code uh, at on the date when the agreement is signed. Uh, if SEBI is aware of this particular document and it comes to foray that there was a certain term sheet which they think was an agreement to agree, uh, they may require the parties to consider the original date as the date of the offer and you know provide uh, certain additional amounts of penalties, etc. So we should be extremely mindful of this. Mm. Okay. Now there are some questions more on the softer aspects of of using a term sheet in a transaction so there's one question uh, let's say in the course of the term sheet there's any alteration of some important clause of the term sheet and the so parties have agreed to that alteration is it good is it good to have an amended term sheet or a side letter signed so that the other side doesn't change their stance pending finalization of the agreements uh it kind of depends on the situations because uh, once you've executed the term sheet, uh, what you've seen is you work and start the diligence process and the councils would have gotten a basic framework to work on the definitive document. So if it is not very fundamental, I think uh, you can consider uh, executing or including the particular provision in the drafting uh, and cover it as part of the drafting. 
However, if you envisage that there's a lot of time required in achieving the definitive document, uh, maybe you can consider doing an amendment agreement so that uh, the parties are very clear as to what is the commercial uh, consideration. And also, uh, another factor here is what is the kind of the term, what kind of term sheet have you executed? Is it a binding or a non-binding term sheet? Uh, so if it's a binding term sheet, it's a contract, so then it's best to do it. Uh, it's enforceable against you, but if it is non-binding, uh, provision which is being amended, you can consider covering it as part of the definitive documents also. Okay, so now there's a further question and maybe I'll bundle two questions together. One is if a counterparty raises something outside the term sheet, how should we react? And then the second one is how would you distinguish between raising something new versus raising something contrary to the term sheet? <laughs> I think uh, it kind of depends, but I think uh, Preliminary advice uh, would be you not know, to uh, kind of overreact to things. This can happen. Like we mentioned, while it may limit the maneuvering, uh, it's still a moral obligation between the parties. So I think take it softly. Don't make it the first point of uh, confrontation in a negotiation where you know they start the discussion saying this is not agreed between the parties. Maybe bring it up after a couple of points. I think that's more a softer approach would be a easier way of dealing with it. Uh, nevertheless, if there is a fundamental disconnect, uh, I think it's best to ask the commercial teams and the principals to discuss and give instructions to the lawyers because uh, some of you are aware if it's left to lawyers, we'll never close any deal. We can keep fighting about it. <laughs> <laughs> right now just on exclusivity or let's say uh, just deal certainty there are a couple of questions around break fees and, and how do you sort of treat break fees as a concept in a term sheet is it useful is it market is it not market uh, I think it's uh, I would say again a demand uh, uh, it's demand and supply for a deal uh, so how good is the asset is the asset very exclusive uh, and a lot of competition is involved for the particular asset uh, and We've seen in the last uh, one, two years, uh, break fee being proposed uh, by a lot of them in the term sheet, uh, but not very common, I would say. Largely, uh, I think the intent is not to profit from any deal. Uh, so there is a fair bit of pushback on this, but you know, at times when um, it's a extremely good asset, you've given an offer uh, and the parties are unable to do the deal within a particular time frame, uh, it's, may be considered by the parties, uh, but I think nevertheless the argument against the break fee is uh, things can be done within the full control of the party, but ultimately a deal may be subject to a third party uh, condition. So net net, uh, it's, I guess it's common uh, abroad to have a break fee, it's well accepted. India, the concept is being explored, but not still very common in a lot of deals to have a break fee. Okay, I'm conscious of time, so last two questions. The first is, Number. To what extent do you expect a term sheet to govern or influence the interpretation of the final agreements? Interesting question, actually. Um, now, what we do put in, in definitive agreements, uh, in, uh, there is a clause uh, which is part of the miscellaneous clause. Uh, it is called as the entire agreement. Uh, it is always, which will very clearly set out that this is the final understanding between the parties and will override every other provision or every other discussion, oral, verbal, etc., between the parties till that stage. To that extent, uh, may not be very important because the intention of the parties is very clar uh, clearly clarified that the definitive document is the main document. If you don't execute that, there is a potential where both of the documents can be read together to assess the intent of the party. So this is a drafting point where we need to be mindful as to the intention of the parties and uh, whether it should be binding fully or you know you want to have some overlay of the term sheet also to be captured in the definitive agreements. Sure. And just very quickly, uh, you mentioned Asha, there is no standard form. Is there any yeah. merit in having an industry association or something of the sort specify formats? Oh, definitely. Uh, I think uh, this is common uh, abroad where in the US uh, you have the uh, US National uh, Venture Capital Association and in the UK you have the British Venture Capital Association. Uh, if you go to their website, you can see uh, standard form documents which have been uh, set out uh, more model documents for a term sheet or even definitive documents as such. So 
if you're doing a certain kind of transaction, uh, it's a good starting point and also helps in uh, assessing uh, and advising your client as to your whether your particular transaction or the terms being offered are in line with uh, some of the industry standards or not. And uh, you know what does happen is if you do have an industry standard for some of the documentation, it just becomes easier for everyone approaching the deal uh, to uh, you know assess and discuss and close out issues in a faster manner and if at all there is a deviation on some of the terms these are the focus terms on which parties are doing the deal and not every single clause which is being renegotiated uh, every time there is an investment so yeah uh, but also uh, it does tend to happen that uh, you know the disadvantage of having uh, something like that would be you know uh, as you're aware uh, some a lot of clients who do investments day in day out do have their own formats and their own requirement so uh, in a way uh, but it's good to have uh, but may, at least it should be a base document to be compared as either way i would say like the rule as such for every transaction so now with that i, I think we need to end our q a there's obviously a lot of questions that we've not been able to address so thank you very much uh, to our audience we'll come back to that but before concluding, uh, we would like to request uh, each one of you to respond to a poll. And uh, uh, Mitesh, if you can please put up the poll. Uh, we take this very seriously as a part of our continuous improvement, ladies and gentlemen. And you will also separately receive a request for your feedback on the webinar. The form takes less than a minute to complete, and it helps us uh, provide invaluable insight on future activities. In fact, this m and Academy and the decision of our management to initiate this was based largely on feedback we received as a part of our separate MA master series. So thank you. Thanks to everyone who participated uh, in the poll. We will collate the data. And it certainly has been a very thought provoking event. If I can just summarize some of the key takeaways, um, as Ashray said, there's no standard formula for a term sheet. It completely depends on what the parties want to achieve and in, in what speed and in what level of detail. And while it's arguable whether it's really binding or not, and whether somebody would actually enforce it against the counterparty, it most certainly is a moral compass for the deal going forward and a very, very important part of the deal process. And while unlike uh, its larger cousins, the share purchase or the asset purchase agreement, it doesn't really define legal liabilities, it does definitely define what all will be included in those larger cousins. And therefore, it's important to have one coherent theme of commercial priorities run through the term sheet and onwards to the closing of the transaction. And this is where quality and essential ad experienced advisors are really essential to the cause. Finally, I would like to thank Ashray for such an innovative presentation and also to our audience for your attention and your overwhelming participation. We do hope you found the webinar interesting and a worthwhile investment of your time. We certainly enjoyed bringing it to you. Please don't hesitate to contact us regarding any matters arising from this webinar. Our contact information is on the slide in front of you. And thank you for your attendance today. We look forward to being of service again at future webinars.